tell me how you initially met Edgar and became involved with Tangerine Dream. Uh, well, I was studying music at the Hochschule, well, basically the Hochschule and the Conservatorium in Berlin, where I'd been accepted um, as the first person that couldn't read music. I was always on the lookout for what was going on new, and I, I was all, already interested in electronic music then, although not much of it existed. And it, the, mostly the only thing that people talked about was music concrete, which was a sort of French uh, school of, of uh, composition, which involved lots of tapes, which was the only electronic gear you had in them days, really, and just splicing the tapes up and playing them at different speeds and backwards and whatever you could do to, to create a, a different sound. So the idea of actually an electronic instrument was still based on a Farfisa organ with a wow wow pedal on it or something like that, or a, an echo chamber, you know, with a, a mic into it, which is what I used to do a lot of. So I heard about, I don't know, God knows who told me, I heard somewhere about this studio in Berlin, they were um, making music concrete, electronic music. I thought, oh, I'll have to go and check that out, see what that's about. Found this studio in the middle of nowhere, on the S-Bahn somewhere I think I had to get onto. I don't think it was in East Germany, it was still in the West, because then, of course, it was all split up with the wall and uh, got to the uh, studio. And there, as I imagine, just a whole line of, of uh, reel to reel tapes playing at different speeds. Uh, friendly fella there, you know, sort of introduced myself to him and he was, you know, very open, interested, or somebody from university wants to come and see what's going on, you know, it's worth talking to him. Uh, and I just had a little chat with him and listened to some of the stuff that was going on and sort of wandered around the studio. And in the corner there's this guy sitting there looking a bit peed off. And I said, uh, oh, how are you? You're a musician, you know, he said, he said, oh yeah, I'm, uh, I've just had, just had a band I've been doing with doing some stuff, you know, and uh, it's just split up and I'm just wondering what to do now. And I said, uh, well, I'd be keen to do something as a threesome. I've always thought about, I always like this triangle idea and the threesome and everything. You know, and I still then was really into improvising and Edgar was, of course, and that's who he was, Edgar Frozer. Um, so we thought, well, we'll put something together. He seemed very keen and very open, which he always has been about doing something different, open-minded about what uh, directions could be found, new directions. So he said, oh, well, I'll, you know, see if we can get together. I said, well, it's, it's got to be a three-piece. And I said, you know, no bass plowing, all that. He said, well, we can't have a band without a bass player. I said, yeah, well, we'll do something different. You know, what? You know, we can do it without a bass player. We'll just make a lot of noise, you know. He said, all right, which is typical Edgar again. We'll do that. So we just looked for a drummer and we thought, well, we'll just have the three of us, the drummer, that's the, the triangle. Uh, Edgar on guitar with an echo chamber, me on flute with an echo chamber and an old Farfisa organ that we found. Just make noises with it, using as many pedals as we could find. And we started into interviewing drummers this uh, black fellow his name i cannot remember nice guy came and started playing i mean, always remember he had these great big black boots on you know great heavy boots which i suppose were useful for punching out the bass drum uh i don't think he lasted very long a month or two or something and then we still still hadn't started any gigs then we're still just rehearsing and then we started started gigging and we for some reason the the guy with the big black boots left and we found this swedish guy who was a good drummer but he had this thing about throwing cymbals all over the place you know so in the gig he'd be throwing cymbals around the and i thought well we've got to get rid of this bloke before he cuts somebody's head off and we end up in prison so we kept looking again and then this tall skinny guy turned up who just sat on the the drums and he was just like a clockwork toy. And he you just sort of like you wound him up and he just went and didn't stop for half an hour, you know, at double speed. 
uh, it was very interesting. And I thought, yeah, well, this guy could be good. And Edgar liked him a lot. I think he'd, he'd known him before. And uh, he said, you know, I, I said, I'm a little bit dubious. But he said, well, yeah, we should go for it. So anyway, that was Klaus Schultz. So that, that became the sort of stable uh, band. And off we went touring all over Germany. Uh, Holland, I think we did a few. And, uh, going really well. It was just great. You know, it was just a full improvised set all the time. Just loved it. It just totally up my street, exactly what I wanted to do. Um, perfect. But I'd had such a hard time in Germany you know, at that time, studying music and having long hair and a beard, you were hated by the general public. They'd stop me getting on the underground and they'd just be shouting abuse at me in German, you know, uh, and bist du student, you know. They obviously thought I was a student, you know, which I was, but they didn't realise I was an English student. <laughs> so my only sort of feedback was I'd just start talking in English and then they'd look really embarrassed and back off, you know. But it had an effect on me. It just, I just felt I wanted to get back to England in some sort of normality. So after a lot of gigs we did, I just said to Edgar, look, I've just got to go home for a bit. You know, he said, OK, well, we'll just do this last gig in Wiesbaden. So we set off for this gig in Wiesbaden. Uh, we couldn't even afford a van at that time. Everything... We had a so-called manager who had an estate car and we used to just stick everything on the roof of the estate car. Travelling down the motorway, off to Wiesbaden, my last gig, and then I could go home for a bit and see my mum. Uh, it, was, it was at night time because we were sort of driving through to get there in the evening and play the next day, I presume. Uh, and we were sort of just driving along and uh, and as you do we were just rolling joints getting no booze never everybody never think drink alcohol but it was just joints basically just having a good smoke you know the whole ritual of it and uh thought oh let's let's get some instruments off the roof and play in the car that's how keen we were driving to the gig at night we still had to be playing even in the car so Edgar had acoustic guitar in the front and I had a flute in in the back and we were jamming away in the car it'd be nice if that had been recorded <laughs> and then we're jamming along having a great time you know Klaus is beating out patterns on the back of the seat and uh, and then Klaus says oh, I've got to have a pee you know I'm bursting I've got to have a pee so uh so the, the manager pulled over on the side of the road, said, just run over there into the head, you'll be all right. He said, oh, okay. So long, lanky Klaus jumps out and runs up to the, runs over to the hedge. And the next minute, I know he's running back, white-faced, screaming, there's nothing on the roof. And I remember thinking in the back, please make this a joke. Everything I own is on that roof. You know, everything, everything I own, basically. And... We all jumped out. Edgar was in the middle of rolling a joint that all went flying everywhere and he jumped out and uh, st stared at the roof. I mean, there's nothing there. There wasn't a mark, nothing. I thought, well, somebody must have stolen it all. You know, I can't imagine why they do that. You know, old speakers and stuff like that. Um, so we thought, well, the only thing to do is to ring the police and we bought a torch off somebody, I remember, and just head our way back the way we came along the motorway, uh, just shining the torch to see if we could find anything. And eventually the police said, well, if we find anything, we'll flash our lights. And eventually we saw the flashing lights. Pulled up along the other side of the road, of course, the police were on the other side, uh, and uh, jumped out the car again. First thing I saw was a flattened piece of speaker and then another flattened thing. Got to the other side of the road, there was my saxophone, like a flat as a pancake, you know, completely flattened. I mean, nothing you could ever do with it. And a policeman came over with a mic, you know, saying, oh, I found this mic, you know, which was my Shaw mic, my lovely Shaw mic. And it was just the bottom half of it with the wires sticking out the top. And I just said, well, keep it. You know? And then I just wandered off into the field, off the motorway. I mean... Just in a daze, I couldn't believe it happened. I was going back home in the morning and uh, I'd lost everything. And I just, tears came into my eyes and I just, 
I always remember that moment so strongly. It's because the dawn was just coming up and it was just so surreal. And um, so there you are. We just had to accept it, jump back in the car, buzzed off to Wiesbaden and Edgar had laid the saxophone in the, in the back of the estate car and people were filing past like it was a funeral, you know, saying goodbye to somebody. But we still had the acoustic guitar and we had the flute, so we just carried on, did the gig. And I remember getting very stoned on some red lip somebody had there. And we were just run, wandering around the audience, you know, just playing and enjoying the music completely. So it didn't stop us. Um, and uh, after the gig, I went home. I just wanted to get back to my mum. It was just so nice getting back to England and hearing everybody speaking the same language, you know, because I couldn't speak German, so I couldn't understand half the things that were going on. It was just got on a bus from the airport and uh, actually I'd arranged for my brother and my mum to pick me up at the airport, but I hadn't thought there's more than one airport in London. That's how out untogether I was. You know, I thought, you know, it's London Airport. So I said to them, London Airport, meet me at London Airport. So they went off to Gatwick or somewhere and I came in at Heathrow or something like that. <laughs> so I had to get a bus and a tube and everything to get home. Um, but it was just great to be back. And Edgar kept writing to me and saying, look, I think we've got a record deal now. Uh, please come back, you know. And I said, oh, I don't know, you know, we need a lot of gear and stuff to do it properly and all that stuff. And he wasn't keen on buying any more gear. And uh, so I thought, well, I'm not sure. I mean, I loved the band. I loved where it was going. I hated Germany for what it had put me through. And the thought of going back there didn't appeal to me. And I put an advert in the Melody Maker. I think I worded it something like... Um, uh, multi-instrumentalists, you know, so it was a bit of a ploy really, but I mean, I played keyboards and I played wind instruments and I was just that sort of person that loved picking up anything that was different. And I got this call from this band who was signed to CBS, you know, I thought, oh, that's a good start. And they were called Steam Hammer. And I went up and interviewed with them and they said, oh yeah, we really like what you do, but we're just going off on tour to Germany next week. I said, oh no, I'm not back to Germany again. <laughs> and they said, well, we'll do the tour first and then you, we, you can come join it up with us when, when, when we get back. And I, uh, I was slick enough to realise you don't do that. You know, if you've been offered a decent job like that, you just get in there and do it. I said, no, no, I'll come to Germany. 